thank you guys for joining us here today. We're excited to have you all here. So my name is Antonio Coffey, and I, I am the educator here at Casa Navarro State Historic Site. Today, our webinar will be Juan Cortina, Colossus of the Rio Grande. Before we start, I just want to give you all some brief information about Casa Navarro. So we're here in downtown San Antonio. We are the 19th century home site of Jose Antonio Navarro, who is most famous for being one of two Tejanos to sign the Texas Declaration of Independence. But uh, what I personally find really interesting is he lived through many different periods of Texas history, starting with the end of Spanish Texas, going all the way to Texas rejoining the United States after the Civil War. And so he got to see a bunch of different dynamic and political shifts here in Texas. And that's always been what's been most interesting about Jose Antonio Navarro to me. But today, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Today, we were talking about Juan Cortina and Dr. Van Hoy uh, from St. Mary's University will be presenting on it. So just a quick uh, section about Dr. Van Hoy. So her term as the O'Connor Chair for the History of Hispanic Texas and the Southwest made, her, made possible her research on the role of Mexican Americans in defending twin republics, Mexico and the United States in the mid 19th century. Those findings have been delivered at conferences and workshops from Texas to Harvard to Mexico City and recently published in a journal in Spain. Her current book is titled Cinco de Mayo and Civil War in the Borderlands. Dr. Van Hoy was one of my own teachers and gave us a lot of chances to do amazing projects like the National World War I Centennial Commission, where we were able to create micro documentaries and were even able to attend the Centennial Ceremony and Remembrance there, as well as working with a professional film crew based in Boston was filmed her students campaign to pay tribute to Abraham Lincoln, as well as her attempt to get Santa Ana Le Santa Ana's leg returned to Mexico. So I'll let Dr. Van Hoy speak more about herself if she wants, but here's Dr. Van Hoy and her presentation as well. Welcome, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And the beautiful thing is that I'm not alone today, although I will hog most of it. Uh, I have uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Gonzalez Lara here with me from uh, Tec de Monterrey. And we'll be joined, I hope, by a, a couple of uh, wonderful cronistas and scholars of the history uh, that I'm talking about. They are here today at the end to help me launch with you the bicentennial of Juan Cortina. So let me just um, start uh, sharing my screen. Got some pretty beautiful things to offer here. Um, <clears throat> let me just see if I can get some of this Zoom stuff off it, whoops. So um, um, we, this is his signature. This is Juan Cortina's signature, which is a treasure because uh, by most accounts, he was unlettered. He was a, a, an illiterate uh, man. But it turns out that that signature, uh, I found it in archives all over the world from New York City, the Heron paper uh, in the archive in the um, public library in New York City to Washington DC, to Nantes, France and Paris and all the way also to Mexico City. So, and of course, Monterrey where my colleague is um, on faculty. So welcome to the big adventure that I've had for 13 years now of, um, of, of hunting uh, Cortina's last traces. Um, we want to thank uh, Casa Navarro um, and, especially, and, and Antonio, who is uh, St. Mary's very own and, and a fine um, master's uh, recent alumnus. So he's He's nicely poised to uh, support Casa Navarro and uh, the Texas Historical Commission, and we're delighted um, at the partnership. So thank you very much. Well, it turns out that it's a great pairing, uh, Jose Antonio Navarro and Cortina. They shared a common cause. Um, his, um, let me, 
beef that up a little bit. Jose Antonio, uh, they never met, but they knew each other. Uh, Jose Antonio wrote Cortina a letter during the uh, Cortina War, sympathizing with uh, Cortina's grievances. Both Navarro and Cortina defended their people and did so at great risk. For San Antonio history fans, here's a little known fact that's, that links uh, Navarro and Cortina. Uh, Cortina's grandfather was uh, executed here in San Antonio over by Salado Creek, over east uh, of Casa Navarro. Uh, he was one of the 14 degollados, the 14 um, royalists whose throats were slit in April uh, by folks who were fighting for freedom from Spain. Jose Antonio Navarro was there that day, April 1st, 1813, when he was a teenager still. When the executioners rode back into town, galloped back into town uh, with their victims' bloody clothing and personal effects dangling from uh, their saddle horns. Navarro was only a teenager and he was pro independence, but he was horrified at the inhumanity. And um, in 1857, so that's, of course, 40, almost 50 years later. Uh, my bad math, 43 years later, Navarro published a list of the 14 degollados in the San Antonio ledger where Cortina's grandfather's name appears. So I can just imagine him as a teenager seeing um, Cortina's grandfather's bloody clothing. Um, who is uh, Juan Cortina? There he is. He... Um, let me start with a mini bio. He, he Juan Nepomuceno Cortina, Gose, Gosea Cochea. Now that gets spelled differently. His Basque maternal surname gets spelled differently here and there, but it's uh, the com most common way of um, pronouncing it is Gosea Cochea. And it was that grandfather, uh, Juan Manuel Gosea Cochea, who was, um, uh, whose throat was slit here in San Antonio in, 13, in 1813. He was affectionately called Cheno Cortina, born in 1824, which is why we're so excited to be celebrating his um, his bicentennial in 2024. He was born to a family that owned thousands of acres uh, along both sides of the Rio Grande, um, all the way up, some of them later, to the Nueces, all the way up to the other end of the um, Nueces Strip. Um, so quite prominent uh, early, you know, er, early founders of Camargo and, and and all of these settlements along the Rio Grande. But he died in 1894 after nearly 15 years in house arrest in Mexico City. So he belongs to Mexico City too, unfortunately. And so how do we reconcile this prominence with this um, with this dishonoring in his late life? Um, for me, who is he to me after 13 years and tracking him down? Uh, Juan Cortina is, uh, is a key figure among the hundreds of Mexican Americans who risked their lives for 25 years to defend Mexico and the U.S. expansion, uh, to defend Mexico and the U.S. from expansionist. And I would count Juan, um, Jose Antonio Navarro among those, and also Angel, his son. Um, my Mexican colleagues will join me at the end to uh, help us launch that bicentennial celebration. In Mexico, so who is he in Mexico? Well, in Mexico, he uh, is a Juarista general. He supported um, the Republican cause the, uh, in, in the 60s. 1860s. He was governor of Tamaulipas. He was hailed as a hero by President Benito Juarez for his defense against the French. And I'll show you a document later where Juarez um, um, honors him and, and, and knows that he is the leader in Tamaulipas. Yet he was arrested by Mexican authorities and imprisoned by them uh, in the 1870s. 
In the US, who is he? Well, he was influential in Brownsville politics, um, prominent uh, Texans in the 18, in 1868 uh, petition for his pardon. That included uh, the then mayor of, um, of Brownsville, where he had presumably attacked and outraged. And it included Rip Ford, who was the one who gets all this credit for defeating him in the Cortina Wars. So how do we reconcile that? If he's, if he's influential and his presumed biggest enemies are petitioning for his pardon, then why do we still think of him 150 years later as a villain, as a bandit? Why is that even still on our markers, our historical markers? So maybe this is our year to change that. Uh, so he's a polarizing figure. He's been demonized. He's been regarded as the red robber of the Rio Grande. Um, let me see if we have an image of that. Yep, here is the uh, here is a historical mark erected in in this in 1970, I think it was. Um, and it says crushing defeat for partisan leader Juan Cortina. This is in Rio Grande City, on the on the river. Uh, in late uh, 1859, laid waste the lower Rio Grande Valley. Cortina's band of 450 were surprised here uh, at daybreak. Whoops. <clears throat> um, uh, by Heinzelman and the U.S. Army troops, joined by Texas Rangers under under John Rip Ford. Cortina fled to Mexico by horseback, um, blah, blah, blah. And, and so we get the idea here. This is the marker today in, in, in um, 2023. <clears throat> uh, so after my presentation, I'll be interested to hear your questions about that and how we might consider a, a revision. Oops, wait. Others lionized him uh, as the Robin Hood of the Rio Grande. At the end of this presentation, you'll see that the Mexico, a museum in Mexico City um, honored um, uh, Oscar Chavez, who wrote a corrido, who wrote a folk song about, um, about Juan Cortina, championing him, and especially in the Cortina Wars. So you get these, this duality between the Texas marker and the corrido. My students and I decided not to be um, voting for one extreme or the other. We have dubbed him uh, the Colossus the Rio Grande. And by the way, big shout out to my students. They are present today. Um, the work I do draws heavily on their contributions. And uh, you, you all can count on this squad to curate the, um, the sources I've collect that I've collected in all these archives uh basically thousands of pages of sources and each student will choose his or her favorite uh small collection and make that more digestible to our public um so big shout out to them to the young people who are contributing so much um so so what we're going to do here he uh we call him colossus the rio grande because like the Colossus of Rhodes in the ancient world, uh, Cortina straddled two shores. Uh, both Colossuses were erected larger than life. Both were felled quickly and suffered terrible indignities, yet both continue to define an era and both um, capture the popular imagination uh, ever since. So um, to trace the rise and fall of Cortina as a Colossus, uh, I want to today give very brief discussion of three periods. Well, first of all, we're going to wrangle this question of the Cortina Wars, um, and that'll take the longest time. Then I'll say something brief about before 1859. Who was Cortina before 1859 and how was he uh, helping defend Mexico and the U.S. from expansionists? And who, what, uh, what did con uh, Cortina contribute after 1859? Because it's a 25-year period 
that he risked his life and property and in the end honor uh, for that defense of Mexico and the US. So uh, my book argues that the, um, that the contradictions in fact can be resolved. This robber versus hero, Robin Hood can be resolved once we get that 25 year um, long view. That's my view. So now let's listen to Cortina's view. What does he say in 1859? He says, and a very long proclamation that he published uh, November 23rd, 1859, but I will read you a brief excerpts in the English translation. This was after Tomas Cabrera was lynched. So I want you to um, remember that name briefly because Tomas Cabrera is, in, is important also as one of the Mexican Americans who defended the US and Mexico from expansionists. So Cortina says, Mexicans, many of you have been robbed of your property, incarcerated, chased, murdered, and hunted like wild beasts. Criminals covered with frightful crimes appear to have impunity because they are not of our race, which is unworthy as they say, to belong to the human species. I am ready to offer myself as a sacrifice for your happiness. And counting upon the means necessary for the discharge of my ministry, you may count upon my cooperation, should no cowardly attempt put an end to my days. That last part means, look, I fortunately have enough money and wealth that I can do this. Folks who are poor, it's harder for them to... to to, to rise to the defense of others. He kind of got the class issue. Um, Cortina ends his um, proclamation of 59 by um, assuring uh, the Mexican Americans that a secret society has been organized um, that for their protection, whose members are, quote, ready to shed their blood and suffer the death of martyrs. Yet he reassures all residents, all Anglo residents, white residents, everybody, um, that, no, quote, no honorable man need have cause for alarm. So he's not threatening good white men or Mexican American men or any men or women, um, just those who are uh, committing atrocities with impunity or theft. So he... Um, he closes by urging, and this is actually pretty, pretty odd. He closes by urging the Mexicans of Texas to trust governor-elect Sam Houston. Sam Houston is going to take office the next month in, in December of 1859. He says, trust Sam Houston to give them legal protection when he takes office. Um, so um, Jose Antonio Navarro uh, understood Cortina. Only two years earlier, Navarro had likewise raised his voice and risked his safety by defending Mexican Texans. He published a series of articles in the San Antonio Ledger in 57 that likewise condemned his people's loss of land and life. Let me quote Jose Antonio Navarro. He said, to complete a picture of misfortune, the few descendants who survive in San Antonio are disappearing, murdered, in full view of a people who boast of their justice and ex excellence. So it's not just Mexican Americans on the border, far away from the centers of government and media, it's also happening in, Mex in, in San Antonio. So in uh, 1860, Jose Antonio Navarro wrote uh, to Cortina during the Cortina Wars, and he sent his letter with his son Angel, whom Houston had sent as a commissioner, uh, to solve the conflict on the Rio Grande. And the elder Navarro mm, addressed Cortina as compatriot and acknowledged that Cortina's, uh, that Cortina had legitimate grievances, but he implored Cortina to restore peace on grounds that his resistance was destitute of every hope of success and glory, which is uh, very sad to hear. Um, likewise for us to understand, so 
Jose Antonio understood Cortina, but what about us? Well, in order for us to understand Cortina, we must understand two things. Um, the major threats to the borderlands, um, which actually most of us don't know now, and how delicately Mexican Americans needed to handle their enemies in the Rio Grande um, in the 19th century, actually in San Antonio as well. So look at this. So this was a safe conduct. And it was so dangerous for Mexican Americans that Anglos had wrote them safe conduct so they wouldn't be killed. Even wealthy, you know, people whom you would presume class might protect. No, they're they're equally targeted. So as you can see, this says executive office, Austin, um, to all Texans, whether in or out of service. So he's saying, yeah, even the non-military people are likely to grab you and uh, uh, this will certify that Sabas Cavazos is a good and true citizen. And by virtue of this safe conduct, he will be treated as such by the, uh, by the governor, Sam Houston, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, <clears throat> so, so he, they have to bear a piece of paper signed by the governor in order to be treated as good and true citizens uh, if you're, if you're Mexican-American. So that's just one hint about how dicey the thing is. Okay, so then there's this question of how delicately Mexican-Americans have to handle it. Well, um, remember that they live on the Rio Grande. They live in the valley, so they've got enemies on both sides, uh, Cortina does, and, and his people. They've got enemies among the Texans who are um, trying to force them off the land or even um, accusing them of things and, and lynching them and murdering them. And in Mexico, it gets just as bad because the French have invaded by the eight, by 1861, the French have invaded and they are, um, they are killing uh, those who resist the empire, Maximilian's imperial rule. And the biggest resistance is coming precisely from rancheros, from regular Mexicans, especially along the north. So if you can just imagine the French are trying to kill you on one side and uh, the Confederates and the, and the um, um, and other kind of vigilantes are trying to kill you on the other side and there are no mountains. That's a, that's, that's a small river to hop. And so your families are living there too. You're elderly and your children. So, so this is a very delicate uh, position. <clears throat> Sometimes they do resort to divide and conquering their enemies um, by allying with a friendlier faction. So that, for example, that thing about Sam Houston, Sam Houston did threaten Mexico, uh, yet uh, Sam Houston had been pushing U.S. Congress uh, to give him money, men, and permission to invade Mexico uh, to make it a protectorate. All of that, you can, you can Google those documents. They're all in, in the congressional record, and those are digitized. So, some people can't imagine that I'm telling the truth here, but this is definitely true. Some, Sam Houston was, was struggling in the 50s. Um, to to make Mexico protectorate. Well, part of the reason, unfortunately, not only was he an, an expansionist, but he was a slaveholder, <clears throat> and and two at least of his slaves, Sam Houston slaves, had run away to Mexico. So he wanted the border much further down, so that slaves from enslaved people from Texas could not escape. On the other hand, that's bad stuff. But on the other hand. Houston um, was their best hope. Uh, he honored Angel Navarro um, as his commissioner, and um, he even outraged Anglo-Texans that he chose Angel Navarro. And as you saw, Houston signed the safe conduct. Okay, let's consider this uh, Cortina War thing. So the first Cortina War uh, starts in 1859. The standard narrative of the war, July 13th, uh, 1859, Cortina shot the sheriff. Sounds like a song. Um, let me see. I think we have something in the chat, but maybe in the Q&A, but I think maybe um, Antonio's monitoring that. 
On September 28th, um, Cortina raids Brownsville with his men and ravaged the town is the way the story goes. And then throughout the fall until Christmas, uh, Cortina kept the Rio Grande in a turmoil uh, until the U.S. Army and Texas Ranger combined forces heroically defeated him and restored order. So that's the traditional narrative. Now, here is a judicious narrative of the war. And in fact, I can't even give the full treatment of it because we'll run out of time. But let me just uh, speak to two points. Uh, the judicious narrative recognizes that what Cortina is doing in that first war is acting as a long-term defender and anti-expansionist. So let's um, let's have a, a look at those two pieces of evidence. <clears throat> First of all, Cortina did not ravage the town. And in fact, um, <clears throat> no looting or destruction happened at all. Uh, in fact, he stopped at the pawn shop for the to buy the you know, to get the arms and ammunition that his men needed, and he paid for them. He targeted only a short list of men who had committed abuses with impunity, and his vigilante action was modeled after frontier justice, very popular all over the United States in 19th century. Um, sounds, you know, it's very bad to our modern sensibilities, um, but that was the standard uh, of the day. On the contrary, it was Brownsville's citizens and rangers who committed atrocities along the Rio Grande under the pretext of punishing Cortina's supporters. Uh, Cortina himself did not lead any further attacks until the Tob till, till Tobin's rangers mm, hanged Tomas Cabrera. So we're back to Tomas. I'm gonna get to him in a second. So what threat was Cortina defending against in 1859 then? If he's not just rescuing a dude, Tomas Cabrera, when the sheriff is beating him, then what is he doing? Um, we can get a hint in um, from Cortina's proclamation. If you recall what I read, Cortina refers to a secret society that, that hints um, he's forming a secret society to fight another secret society. Uh, that secret society's uh, threat is mounting against Mexico and, and Mexican Americans in this time in 1859. And that the name is um, the Knights of the Golden Circle. My students are probably one of the a few sets of students in, in the United States or Mexico who even have heard of that group. But Google those folks. That's that. Those guys were a piece of work. The KGC, as the as, a, as the Knights of the Golden Circle were called, was not just a marginal group, not just a bunch of folks who were down on their luck and looking for something. It included prominent Texans, including Lubbock himself, and they were openly members. So what uh, what do they want? What does the KGC want? Well, its explicit purpose was to take over Mexico and Central America and the Southern US and Cuba to make a golden circle as an empire for slavery. So um, this was no idle threat. After Cortina was defeated, the Grand Marshal of the KGC in Harrison County, in Marshall, Texas, and his name was Greer, if you want to look things up, offered Sam Houston mounted troops to invade Mexico because Sam Houston wasn't getting support from Congress for his protectorate. So Greer says, hey, we got, we got men. They'll do it for you. So in the spring of 1860, the KGC actually gathers at the river to prepare their invasion. A lot of things happen, long story, including or Houston saying, forget it, dudes come on back. But the upshot is that they gathered a couple of times, but did not invade. Now, the cliffhanger, who's Tomas Cabrera? Um, we have time for just one piece of evidence that the Cortina War was Mexican-Americans' defense against expansionists. Whereas most historians dismiss um, Cabrera, the, the guy who was getting pistol whipped by Sheriff Shears, 
they dismiss him as Cortina's servant or his ranch hand or maybe his father figure or something like that. Um, but let me show you this, um, this document. This you can also Google online because it's also congressional record. So uh, what you have here is a list of Tejano, uh, actually now Tejanos, um, people from the Rio Grande Valley who were originally from Tamaulipas, not te Texas, uh, asking Congress. So I'm going to toggle between these two. They're asking Congress to establish the Nueces Strip, former Tamaulipas, as a federal territory like New Mexico. They're saying, look, we do not want to be part of Texas. We've been part of Texas since 1848. And in fact, it was kind of ugly after the, in the Republic period. And it's not going well. Please, please, please make us a protect, uh, um, a, a um, territory, not part of the state of Texas. So that's all these guys. There's a lot of folks you, whose names you might recognize including, um, let me see if I can drag this stuff off. Oh yeah, it's right behind my participant uh, message. Let me get rid of that. Uh, so they've misspelled it and things are messy in the, in the 19th century, but that is, um, is, um, is one of the, you can see in this name, if you know this history, there's a lot of prominent people. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there is, um, let's see, am I having trouble getting to the next one? I don't know why. For some reason, it's not letting me go to the next one. I might have to, oh, there we go. And then look at the second page. Uh, there is Tomas Cabrera. Tomas Cabrera is right there. And so is, um, so is, uh, so are some of the, um, Cortina people, including Juan Nepomuceno Cortina. So they are, Tomas Cabrera is not just some ranch hand. He's actually sticking his neck out because if you're contesting Texas as authority over the Rio, over the river, you're already in big trouble. And you're in trouble for a second reason because they are petitioning, they are asking Senator Seward, they are asking Senator Seward to put their petition on the Senate floor. Now, Senator Seward is the most hated of all the elected officials in 1850 for two reasons. One, he's abolitionist. And two, he, he's a leading ab abolitionist actually in the, in, the, in the Congress. And two, he, has, he is in 1850 precisely going to defend Mexican-Americans in California as well when they try to strip them of their citizenship rights. So, wow, not only are they asking for federal territory, but these dudes are asking also Seward. So that's gonna guarantee you to get uh, in the crosshairs of Texans who are not, for the most part, feeling uh, favorable to the abolitionist position, nor to the advocacy for the rights, the full rights as established by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. All right. So, um, so I invite you to consider that Cabrera was co-petitioner and, um, and that the, the hyper-personalistic labeling of um, Mexican-Americans as just doing stuff because they're buddies or family or servants um, suggests that they're not fighting for justice, uh, that, that rather they're kind of embroiled as caciques or caudillos in a, in a profit or power play. Um, the second Cortina War, let's move real quickly to the second Cortina War. Um, <clears throat> well, that, that starts in April of 61. Now, I want you to remember that um, <clears throat> that's when the Civil War breaks out. But even before the surrender of Sumter, Fort Sumter, Tejanos were defending the Union on the Rio Grande. They never get credit for that. Forty armed Tejanos and Mexicans under Ranchero Antonio Ochoa, um, <clears throat> and here I'm quoting the Corpus Christi Ranchero uh, publication of a uh, document from twenty from April twentieth, sixty one. Quote: Directed by or under the influence of Cortina. 
moved to seize the county seat of Carrizo, uh, a, quote, attempting to keep the county officers from taking the Confederate oath of office, end quote. When they decided to back down, they issued a pronunciamiento, a proclamation against the Confederacy. Now that's just suicidal in April of 1861 to be uh, 40 dudes uh, going for the Union. Even white pro-Union people got killed for that, as we all know from the hanging of the German Hill Country Unionists. <clears throat> More stuff happened. Uh, Cortina comes over in May uh, to help these folks. He rendezvous with 50 men with Ochoa. More, more things happen. It's a, it's a, it's a big, big deal. Um, somebody who had promised them something later kills one of them. There's retaliation. It's a mess, but, um, <clears throat> but I want you to hold on to two facts. One is it was pro-union, not just a rampage. And two, um, Cortina was not defeated. He just crossed the river. And in fact, let me quote you here from uh, Heinzelman's, or maybe it was uh, Ford's memoirs, Cortina, quote, gained the opposite side of the river in safety and in, in ascending its banks, faced about, turned around, took an apparent disdainful view of his recent antagonist and master, uncovered his head, and with characteristic dignity waved his hat, bidding them in the blandest tone a courteous temporary adieu, informing them that he would give them another call in a few days. So what, what you read about, you know, Rip Ford and Heinzelman in the U.S. Army just crushing him is not at all true. He crossed the river and, uh, and, and reappeared. So backstory, um, backstory real quick, because now we're getting into the Civil War piece. Well, <clears throat> in February 15th, 1861, so before this brouhaha on the river, this second Cortina War, mm, um, and February 15th was one week before the referendum in Texas. Texas Texans were supposed to vote if they wanted to um, leave the Union, but this was a week before the Texas Volunteer Forces, including 150 KGC members, including John Robert Baylor, forced the surrender of the federal troops and arsenal at San Antonio. That is an act of treason. That's Americans attacking the U.S. Army. Uh, and especially because they had no authority from the referendum, the people of Texas. They couldn't even say they were acting in their names. Uh, following that quick victory, the volunteers who were mostly from the KGC companies forced the surrender of all federal posts between San Antonio and El Paso, and who else was out there? Robert E. Lee. They forced his surrender. They invited him to join them, and he said, absolutely not. Uh, in fact, that afternoon, he went to see his pro-union pal right here in San Antonio, a guy named Charles Anderson, but that's another story. The Argyle Club today is Charles Anderson's home. Um, if you need further evidence about the nature of this as a hostile takeover, uh, act of treason, look at the March 4th. And by the way, this was the biggest depot of resources in of the U.S. Army in the entire nation of the United States. So they just really made off big with a lot. Um, I know you've been told that civil war wasn't important in Texas, but that's not true. So March 4th, 1861, so that's a couple weeks later, Lincoln gives his inaugural address. So you can Google that as well. Uh, he refers to the hostile takeover of San Antonio by warning. You'll see, he doesn't say San Antonio. He doesn't say anything explicit, but you can see that he's warning that the federal government will defend its military uh, installations and soldiers and supplies. So, um, so he is paying attention to this aggression. 
Okay, quickly before 1859, because I think I want to wrap it up in, in five minutes so that I can bring my colleagues uh, to join us. Before 1859, I'll mention only one other instance, um, and that's the Mexican-American War, the U.S.-Mexican War. Cortina organized, he was only 22 years old, but he organized in 46 uh, a company of rancheros that he, whom he named Tamaulipas, because he's reminding people that this is not Texas, this is Tamaulipas, another state in Mexico. And he joined Arista, General Arista was leading the defense of Mexico uh, along the border in 46. They lost, as you know, he saw it. It was almost on his mother's own land. His mother's land was split um, by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, she was forced to sell her land that is today Brownsville. That used to be Cortina's mother's land. She was forced to sell it for $1. <clears throat> uh, let's see, here's Brownsville. Um, oops, wait, let me see if I can. There's Brownsville. Uh, you can see how close uh, Matamoros and Brownsville are, but that was all his mother's land right there. Uh, 1850, it, well, that was a separatist movement, as you heard. So what about after the Cortina Wars? What, hap what does Cortina do to contribute? And his, his people, what do they contribute to defending Mexico and the U.S.? Well, I'm kind of running out of time, but, um, uh, you know, we've got a year. We've got 16 months until his birthday. So I'll, we'll, my students and I will be uploading uh, more videos and more resources for you to track what the Cortina contributed. Um, but let me just say, who are, who's Lincoln to Mexican Americans? Who's Lincoln to Cortina? Lincoln, they know Lincoln. In the 18, in 1847, Lincoln is a freshman rep representative in Congress from Illinois, and he stands up, barely had his seat for a couple of weeks. First thing he does, stands up and condemns the U.S. invasion of Mexico as illegal. Mexicans didn't forget that. It ruined his career there for a while, but, he, but they remember. Um, Lincoln also in the 1860s when he's president recognizes Benito Juarez's government uh, and refuses to recognize the empire, the French invasion. So they, they appreciate that too. Lincoln stayed in solidarity with Mexico. More about Corwin also I could say and Seward, but we'll, we'll, we'll let that go. So let me show you a, a little bit of um, how Cortina defended the Union during the Civil War. This is a complaint from uh, a French um, commander uh, writing to Seward, who's Secretary of State under Lincoln. And you see that he's saying, here's what Cortina is doing. Ham doing. Um, you know, they're, fur they're furnishing arms, the Union is furnishing him arms and munitions and all of this. Here's another one. Again, with Cortina, uh, the French ambassador to the U.S. is complaining to the Secretary of State about all the stuff that Cortina is doing to help the Union uh, and attack the French in Mexico. Mex uh, Cortina helps Mexico defeat um, the French. First of all, um, Cortina goes to Puebla in, in 1863 and helps resist um, the French invasion. Um, <clears throat> he loses, uh, but as you know, he, he does become um, high ranking. He becomes general and uh, under the Juaristas. And here is Benito Juarez, Juarez writing Ignacio Mariscal, his, um, and it, he's saying, who are the commanders? Escobedo, Mendez, Cortina, et cetera, in these, all these states in the north. Tamaulipas, Nuevo León, and Coahuila. Well, if you ask Mexicans and, and ask them, okay, who are the heroes? Who are the Juarista generals and heroes in the north? They're going to name only Escobedo. Why? 
because Escobedo wrote the military reports, reports. And I have the document where he says, well, I wish I had time to name everybody who did a wonderful job out here, but we're in the middle of a battle and I don't have time. So that <clears throat> is why they get ignored. And that's what I'm hoping Mexico will um, forgive. This is a, this is a, a piece about how Confederates are going to Mexico. They'd reached Monterey. They had, uh, they offered the emperor uh, to raise a battalion of Texans for guerrilla service, promising them 10,000. So the Confederates are going across the border in 1865, trying to help the French. So Portina is stopping those guys too. And here they are. This is a battle map of um, the Santa Gertrudis. And here, here are the Confederate counter guerrillas. They're in pink down here, as you can tell by this, um, this um, thing. So here's a question. If, if, um, if Cortina and Mexican-Americans defended so well against threats so great, why don't Mexico and the U.S. honor this history? That's the question, right? Cortina gets discredited. Um, his his ripboard and, uh, and a bunch of people try to get him exonerated during the Reconstruction government. Um, <clears throat> but the ex-Confederates, uh, especially Richard King and Mifflin Kennedy, want to pin on him uh, the cattle theft, the, 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 the cattle, the loss of their cattle, because by then he's high-ranking general in, 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 in Mexico, and they figure that they can, if they pin it on him, they can force Mexico to pay their claims for the loss in this claims commission of 1868 that really didn't take off until early 70s. And so here is some testimony from that claims commission. I'm Francis Campbell. I'm acquainted with Mifflin Kennedy. Yep, he did it. In in I was coming down the river Rio Grande in um, in 1860. See, they just keep blaming him about that Cortina War thing. We were attacked by Cortina and his men, blah, blah, blah. So, so they just keep blaming him. This is actually a testimony of Mifflin Kennedy, who's also blaming Cortina. Um, all of those charges were proven false, but the point is that they rile people up so badly that, court, that Mexico was just forced to get him off the border. So first he was arrested by Lerdo de Tejada, who held him in prison in Mexico City and never charged him. So then when Lerdo de Tejada was overthrown, uh, Benito Juarez is already dead, by, by, by Porfirio Diaz, Diaz um, lets him go. He's, he's up the border again. Texans um, threaten to invade Mexico again if they don't get rid of Cortina. And Diaz sends him back to prison. And then when Texans aren't looking anymore, he gives him an hacienda and lets him live in house arrest in Azcapotzalco where he dies. Okay, so let me just introduce my colleagues. I'm going, I'm hoping that, um, well, we have here um, already present uh, my colega, Dr. Gerardo Gonzalez Lara from El Tec de Monterrey. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Gerardo. And also, I don't know if we, we're still waiting and hoping that um, Dr. Martin Salinas Rivera is going to be present. He is uh, an, ex he's a, a UT PhD and he is a, um, an extraordinary historian doing the digging in those archives. Remember the archives that I was talking about, I haven't gotten to, I haven't been able to get to any of those. So I'm counting on investigador, Antonio Guerrero and um, Dr. Martin, uh, their expertise and their um, deep work on Cortina and Cortinistas and all the folks who contributed. So while we're waiting for them to come in, um, Dr. Gerardo, can you um, can you tell us? I think you were talking to me about a possibility uh, of um, of working out some initiatives between El Tec de Monterrey and uh, 
and the and the mayor's office here in San Antonio. Yes, and for this conference, this information is very important to to discover to meet uh, this different man, different optic. But you have some question of the students. Can you see these questions? I I don't think I can. Let me see. Let me see if yeah. I can. See. Oh, that. Oh, wait. Uh, maybe. In English, you have four questions for Dependent. Salomon. Oh, whoops. Yeah, I all of that. Okay. There are some of the questions we were going <clears> to, <throat> sorry, touch on them at the end, or if you're ready for questions uh, now, Dr. Van Hoy. Well, actually, let me just quickly, uh, I just want to introduce you then to my colleagues. Uh, also, um, um, uh, Investigador Antonio Guerrero is here, and I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, he is also uh, leading our team. So it's uh, it's the four of us so far. And um, and so we're just very excited about the bicentennial. Um, uh, Don Antonio, quisiera saludar o platicar un poco de lo suyo. O... Creo que está all, um, sin... Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Buenas tardes. Este, estoy en Santa Catarina, Nuevo León. A, aunque la figura de Juan Eponzano Cortina corresponde fundamentalmente al llamado Bajo Río Bravo, por alguna circunstancia, eh, el, lo, el papel que tiene entre los caudillos y los personajes ilustres de la frontera tamaulipeca, en la cual este, corresponde a una serie de prohombres, entre ellos Antonio Canales, eh, eh, don eh, Mariano Escobedo, eh, Santiago Vidal, incluso eh, muchos de ellos eh, eh, pugnaban por una nueva relación entre centro periferia. Me refiero a la Ciudad de México, que durante el siglo XVIII y siglo XIX mantuvo olvidado completamente al resto de las regiones del país. Y a nosotros nos pegó bastante porque decían que eh, estábamos. Eh, desamparados frente a los salvazos e incursiones de los llamados indios bárbaros. Eh, por otro lado, el contrabando eh, yeah. se producía ganado, piloncillo, maíz, pero no eh, este, ropa, alimentos y se tenía, se tenía que traer de Texas y, y preferentemente el puerto de Matamoros, Bagdad. Entonces, eso... So, eh, bueno, y, y luego también después de los tratados de Guadalupe Hidalgo, como dijo la, la doctora Tere, eh, quedamos expuestos a, pues a filibusteros tejanos. Aunado también de que la región, en la región se quedaron muchísimos militares que participaron en la campaña de Texas y durante el, el sitio de, de, de la ocupación norteamericana. Entonces, eh, pues esto agudizó muchísimos los problemas y en, y, y en consecuencia la inseguridad y demás, y, y, y cómo se va a definir la frontera a partir de un proyecto de participación en la cual se tenía que defender no solo la identidad, sino la integridad y la soberanía. El papel de Juan Epomuceno Cortina es fundamental para esto. Eh, un ser incomprendido, a mi juicio, falta mucho recuperar su memoria, reivindicarlo. Fue un gran personaje. Eh, que Lo vemos al margen en un proyecto llamado La República del Río Grande, de 1840, y también, y, y, y cómo va ondeando hacia un movimiento, hacia otro, pero a fin de cuentas este, se alineó al, del lado de los buenos y, y, y los buenos fueron los que lo relegaron. En, entre ellos es don Porfirio Díaz, un matamorense que fue presidente de la República entre 1880 y 1884, que es Manuel González. Es un honor estar con ustedes, perdonen mi inglés, pero yo tengo mucho que no lo, no lo practico, pero estamos a sus órdenes. Thank you, thank you. Well, I I translated in the chat, but I don't know if all if all the participants can see it. So this is this is great. Thank you so much, uh, Don Antonio, and I'm looking forward to our team. We got an awesome team here. Um, now, uh, what we want to do real quick before we open it up to questions is, uh, well, here is the um, here's here's the Museo Nacional de las Intervenciones in Mexico City, and they're talking about Cortina and playing the corrido. So we're looking forward to teaming up with them. But also, I want everybody to see our uh, QR code. So those of you who might be interested in joining us. Um, uh, this May, for his 199th birthday, you can 
we'll we'll send you an invitation. We will send you the, what the students curate. Uh, and my student Santos Mencio is building the website. So we're all going to figure out a plan to make Cortina the hottest thing in the U.S. and Mexico. So please, uh, please take a picture if you're interested, um, because this is the moment that um, that Casa Navarro and THC has offered us. And if we fail, well, we'll just keep building our list of uh, and and and, and <clears throat> lighting our candles for the people who did risk their lives. And here are some of them. Um, to defend the United States and to defend Mexico from the expansionists. So I really appreciate it. So happy to have my team. Looking forward to adding all of you. And let's have those questions. Antonio, we turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Van Hoy. We actually only have time for maybe one or two one. questions because we do <laughs> okay. have to end here at one. Um, but we had <laughs> someone asking, what was Cortina's view on the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? Well, he was heartbroken, of course, because uh, it gave uh, not only Texas to the U U.S., it gave Tamaulipas too, because the area between the Nueces River that dumps out in Corpus and, and the Rio Grande is Tamaulipas. So they're saying, why are you taking Tamaulipas? But that's how it happened. So, but he did appreciate that the rights were supposed to be respected. The problem was that they weren't. Right. And then the other question, um, was it ever difficult to read primary documents or understand what was being said while you were doing the research for this? Wow. Yes. There's no typewriters, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, so except for the congressional records, that was all nicely typed out, but <clears throat> most of the stuff was handwritten, but beautiful handwriting and you get the hang. I'll oh. share my students and I'll be sharing that with everybody. So I think we have time for maybe just one more question. I was one uh, I wanted to ask you. I know you mentioned that he was upset about his mom being forced to sell the land for one dollar. I remember hearing that was from his family's lawyer that he also had a grievance with. Is that correct? Absolutely. And his brother-in-law, who uh, kind of strong-armed her into doing that. In fact, his brother-in-law was one of the ones on his list whom he had hoped to kill that night, September 28th, 1859. A lot of, bottle of bad blood and weird stuff on those land deals as, as a lot of people know. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you, Dr. Van Hoy, the Texas Historical Commission and Casa Navarro really appreciates the talk. I hope all of y'all listening here today were able to get as much out of it as I was. We hope to see y'all again at our next and our continuing webinars as well. And Dr. Van Hoy, once again, thank you to you and your colleagues for everything that you've done for us. Y'all take care and y'all have a great day. Thank you. And thank you also to my colleagues for joining us. And I hope we get all of y'all big team. Thanks to Casa Navarro. Bye, Antonio. All right. Bye, y'all.